Welcome to Nature Therapy Online. Hi friends and welcome to Season 2, Episode 8 of Nature Therapy Online, the podcast. And My name is Stephen McCabe and I'm an ecotherapy practitioner living in the lowlands of Scotland in Midlothian. And um, this is a podcast all about connecting to the earth for the well-being of ourselves and for the well-being of the planet too. Um, it's not about us taking from the earth to to, to feel good. It's um, it's about relationship between us and the the wider than human. So I'm here in my village of Temple, where I record most of my podcasts, and. Uh, it's a wee bit noisier than usual today, actually. Um, it's a pretty quiet rural village, so I'm I'm over on the the fields behind the what's called the the old school, where there used to be a, a teeny tiny little school for for children. It's now a t- teeny tiny art gallery uh, for for big children like me, and uh, it's a gorgeous day. It's a gorgeous winter day. January it's got a real chill in the air but the sky is so clear today it's so clear it's this gorgeous beautiful light blue with just the occasional very thin cloud here and there I love the the crispness, the crispness, I should say, and, and the clarity on days like this, these winter days where it's it's bright and clear. And sometimes I think what people struggle with in winter is not so much the cold. You know, if you live in a particularly cold country, but sometimes it's the darkness and and the grimness that can come. Um, certainly in Scotland, anyway. You know. Just having this light is beautiful. So I'm stood by the um, by the field. I'm I'm looking out over just openness. There are a couple of sycamore trees in front of me, and uh, directly ahead of me, there's a ancient horse chestnut tree that's about at least five hundred years old, apparently. apparently. I've spoken about it before on my podcast. It's a, it's a really enchanting tree. It's uh, you know it, it 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 just twists and turns and in so many ways. Its its boughs are just so unbelievably thick and strong and yeah, it's uh, it's got a real presence here. And you might hear in the background. Uh, first of all, there's my dog Yoro as usual. Hello, Yoro. Hello, hello. He's just having a little roll in the grass. Yeah, you're enjoying the sun, aren't you? In the distance, you might hear children. There's a little forest school tucked away in a copse of trees. Can you hear them? Maybe you can, maybe you can't in the distance. And there's the occasional bit of traffic going by. So, So straight ahead is the basically farmland to my left uh, the earth travels down into a valley where the the forest is that I often work in for these podcasts getting closer to the noise of the children that's the sound of children in nature Just enjoying that pure connection, the magic of it. They're not watching cartoons. They're not on an iPad or a phone. They're not playing with their plastic toys behind four walls. 
they're making little tree huts they're playing they're probably connecting with imaginary or mythical beings in their imaginations it's a magical child time childhood isn't it and I love this movement of, of forest schools. I don't know, um, obviously I don't know where, where the listeners are all from and if this is a movement that's happening in your country as well, but certainly in a lot of Western countries, there's a movement to get young children out in nature, learning in nature, playing in nature. And here we have this, this little copse of trees. I don't think there's a mythical monster in there. and they build huts and there's little tree stumps that they clearly sit around. I go in there with Yoro a lot, it's really nice. They sound really happy. So I hope you can hear them, but if not, you'll have to take my word for it, folks. But I'm going to move away from the little forest school over by the copse of trees and I'm going to walk uh, towards the, the hedges on the, the field of the farmland here because the main theme of today's podcast is about taking in views. So experiencing the big picture, however you want to define that, Obviously the big picture is uh, very often a small picture in the grander scheme of things, but you know, let's not be picky. <laughs> you could say that the earth is a tiny picture in the context of the whole universe if you wanted, but I'm, uh, I'm in danger of getting pretentious here. So I think you get my drift about taking in wider views, taking in as much as you possibly can of what's around and uh, you know very often in ecotherapy working with with tiny details can be so powerful and and, and just raise so much awe and inspiration but uh, sometimes taking in what we can see far away from us and and experiencing ourselves uh, in, in in that perspective of being smaller it can also be really liberating and in our smallness in the grander scheme of things and the reason i'm walking this way is because there is just an incredible view here and it's a view that i don't know i never really paid that much attention to when I first moved to this village. So we're really high up in the village of Temple. I don't know exactly, maybe we're like 200 meters above sea level. Don't quote me on that, but it doesn't feel like you're that high up when you're here because the travel um, up into the hills is, is so gradual that here I just feel like I'm walking on flat earth like anywhere else, you know, but when you come over to these fields and you look out and like today such a clear day and i see probably 30 or 40 miles into the distance it's just awe inspiring and oh there's someone in the bush there a little black bird you can hear the scurrying about. I'm right in front of it now. Can you hear? I'm stood in front of the dry hedgerow. I think it's a hawthorn hedgerow. It's really right in front of me. The scurrying you can hear is actually Euro currently, so the blackbird is really still. He's kind of peeping at me with his beady eye 
through the bare branches. And he is a he. So he's jet black. The female blackbirds are brown. So, you know, I think the female blackbird should be offended that the species is not called brown bird, to be frank. But I'm going to move up a little bit because there seems to be a, a, a wee gathering of dog walkers coming up here now. Try to keep on the move and talk you through a little bit of this incredible view that's here. So, the first thing that pulls my mind is the, my attention is the faith of four. So, a faith in, in Scots is basically a bay. So, it's a huge bay of seawater that reaches into the city of Edinburgh in the distance. And above me, as soon as I started talking about that, a seagull flies against the pale blue sky, it's gliding effortlessly. And we're a good 20 miles away from the sea here, but it feels like you're never that far from the from seawater in Scotland. So the, the gulls just, um, the seagulls, you know, they're, they're never that far away. They're... <laughs> so I'm looking at the, the sea here, the seawater, the faith, the bay, the faith, the forth, whatever you want to call it. Just the blueness of it, and just beyond this strip of sea, there are the hills of, of Fife, which is still to this day called the Kingdom of Fife. See distant green hills. Not mountains, just soft, pointy hills. There's the blue of the water, the blue of the sky, and this. Uh, hazy greenness. It's a wee bit misty all the way over there as far as I can see. But it's a pretty incredible view. And before we get there, we've got just miles and miles of, of land. You've got the whole city of Edinburgh. Closer than that, we've got the, the South Esk Valley, the forest I mentioned before. Trees all around of all kinds. There are redwood trees there. Some of you may have heard me stroking them in previous episodes. They're now down in the valley. I'm up above looking down. And there's still just more, there's so much more. But I've just taken a little turn um, away from the view just for a few moments because um, I just want the little gathering of people and their dogs to pass by before heading back because, you know, I'm, I've, I'm sure my neighbors already think I'm eccentric enough without them watching me walking around talking about the hills to myself. Although to be honest with you, I think they've already seen me do that on many an occasion. So, damage limitation, let's say. I'm actually, I've turned and walk, started to walk towards the sun now. You can probably hear Yoro there in the grass. It's little doggy trotters. And the sun's just uh, beaming down on my forehead here, this low winter sun. It's gentle warmth is just really welcome. It's light is so welcome. After so many grey days, although we're having quite a 
quite a mild winter in in the south of Scotland, I have to say. But the view here is very different. You know, this way we look and we get the more foothills. So really there's uh, some farmland and and some Scots pine trees ahead. So it's just a thin, thin copse really. Uh, but then beyond it, it's it's the land, the Morfoot Hills, and they they they're really soft. The Morfoot Hills. It's like this big, long, soft snake that sits in the distance, blocking view from the the view of anything beyond it. And interestingly, I don't often stop and and look in this direction at the the, the view from here and got a completely different quality. I think there's something about the the sea, the view of the sea in the other direction when I look north. There's something about the other direction that is just, it's, it's, it's spectacular. I didn't even finish describing to you. I only got halfway of what I described, but don't, but don't worry, I'll be, I'll be brief, <laughs> as brief as I <laughs> as I can. See, I've turned back around now. Sorry, more foothills. I, I think they're a bit offended, first of all, that I called it a snake, and secondly, that I just turned away as soon as I realised that the group of people with their dogs have passed by. So, um, I do apologise to the more foothills, but, but not today, love. I'm coming for this view, the view north, and where I was describing the bay area and I was just describing the forest in front of us and the, the hills of Fife right in the background and the, the settlement of hundreds of thousands of people in Edinburgh closer by, although to be honest from this view it looks like a village. There's also this magnificent spectacle that you have right in the centre of Edinburgh called Arthur's Seat which is related to the, the, the legend of King Arthur. We don't know quite why it's called Arthur's Seat, but it's pretty much a given now that, you know, a lot of people for a long time didn't um, re really connect King Arthur with Scotland so much, but there, there seems to be some, um, some new evidence if you like or at least some study into folklore however these amazing magical people study folklore and realize these things but you know i, I think that there's a, a, a big realization that yeah the, the legend of king arthur is very much linked to scotland and, and could be very much linked to edinburgh and it's this big from here it's like this big black hill right in the center of the city and do you know this I think is one of the things that made me fall in love with nature again as an adult. It was moving to the city of Edinburgh. I never would have moved from Manchester, where I lived before, straight to somewhere like Temple, where I live now, because I thought I was a city person. And how wrong I was. I thought I was a city person all my life just because I'd lived in cities all my life. And when I moved to Edinburgh, which is the capital of Scotland. But it's like the countryside in the city, Edinburgh. You know, it, it, it's, it's just all this gorgeous, ancient, gothic architecture. Architecture, and within it all is just hills rising out from the centre, you know. The biggest tourist attraction in Edinburgh, which is an incredibly tour touristy city, is a hill that's free to climb and go up and you know everyone does it when they come here you know everyone who can anyway not everyone can climb up a hill you know but it's a pretty big hill and the views are incredible and it's just such a gift you can walk up in these hills in the middle of the city this this park that stretches on for miles and in part of this park it, there's just hardly anyone there i i realized that the part that I used to go up, which is called Winnie Hill, just next to Arthur's Seat, when I used to live down there, um, was reported to be a, a fairy hill, a place where the fairies lived, according to the old beliefs. And I can well believe that that's still the case now. Something very magical about being able to walk up onto the hill 
in the middle of a capital city and just walk and no one's around, you know, on a really quiet day. And so that's what I'm looking at now. I've got that strip of, of, of blue seawater to the right. I've got Arthur's Seat, this big lumpy black hill right in front of me. Straight ahead, I say right in front of me, I mean it's about 20 miles away, you know, but it looks so much closer and that's the thing about views, isn't it? And then my favourite of all, just to the left of me, are the Pentland Hills. They're probably about five miles away. I think they're my favourite hills in the whole world. They're the, the hills of the Lothians. They stretch from Edinburgh into Midlothian and down into the Scottish borders. And with the, the, the sun being out today, they just look so, so smooth, you know? pointy jagged hills beyond beyond so many copses of trees ahead of me there's the forest here and then beyond that a green hill beyond that more trees beyond that another hill and then beyond right into the horizon the smooth Pentland hills gorgeous I view them from my garden. And you see now, over towards Arthur's seat, there is a gathering of crows. They're swirling up and around into the blue sky. They're like a spell, they're like a, they're like a, it's like a tornado of crows. Just swirling around doing their own thing they look to me like they're having fun they're not going to a destination in this linear fashion they're not just traveling from one place to another they're swirling it looks social and I don't want to just tell you about this amazing view that I've got here just for the sake of it I want to reflect on this to hopefully inspire you to to connect with 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 views and, and landscapes that can bring so much into you because the thing is when i look here it's not just about oh wow isn't that a beautiful view oh there's the sea there's the hills you know there's something that reminds me of some folklore and, and here's all my own personal associations and cultural associations and all of that but it's just about how much is here. I, I could walk from the village to the back of these fields with my mind full of just complete and utter crap, you know, and be complaining to myself about, I don't know, a colleague at work or, or, or stressing out about how much work I've got. And I do have a lot of work to do when I get home, folks. So I'm, I'm, I'm pushing that one away. But... It's easy to live your life like that, isn't it? You know, walking from my village to the back of this field here and thinking about all the things I need to do when I get home, what, what does that achieve, you know? It achieves nothing. The work will look after itself when I get home. And, you know, being here and being in this, this view where there's just this sense of, of me and Yoro, these tiny creatures, these tiny impermanent creatures who just appeared on this planet seemingly out of nowhere and will disappear back to wherever it is we came from. Hint, it's the earth beneath my feet. That's what this view does for me. There's my neighbours, folks, behind the hedge. Be a little bit quieter for a moment. Yoro's having some kind of standoff with two Labradors between the hedge. His little whippet ears are on edge. Oh, have you come back, eh? Hmm? 
Did you give them the evil eye, did you? Did you? You naughty boy. You naughty whippet. Hang on, have I put your... Oh, do you know what, folks? I've just realised that I've put his harness on in a really weird and ridiculous way. Yeah, that's not very comfortable for you, is it? So I'm going to click it back <laughs> into place. Sorry, Euro. I'm sorry about that. You'll be getting judged by those Labradors, won't you? Eh? You'll be getting judged. Yeah. Okay, I'll give you a biscuit. Here we go. You want to hear the crunch, folks? Nothing like the wild sounds of nature. The whippet crunching a gravy bone. But where was I? Oh yes, the meaning of life. <laughs> nah, I, I don't think... Uh, <laughs> I'm not approaching cracking that one, yeah. But that's what this view does, you know. It, 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 it takes me away and it can do the same, I think, for all of us when we take in the bigger picture. We feel like we are the centre of the universe, don't we? I'm always saying this on the podcast, but for as long as this podcast runs, I'm going to continue to, to say it because we do. We don't logically think it, but we feel it, don't we? When we're not paying attention, we think we're the centre of everything. That whenever something happens to us, it, it's the... It, 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 it's, it's the centre of the, of the whole of existence. That's what we feel and that's what we experience. Even though logically we know it's not true, it's what we, we feel when we're not careful and we don't pay attention. And it's so awe-inspiring to, to stand somewhere where there's a, a huge view. And you know what, like some of you who are listening might not be able to go somewhere where there is a big view. You might not even be able to leave the house. And that's okay, you know, connect in another way. You know, we've got technology. If you, if you can't get to a, a, a view, a place where you can just take in a wider sense of the earth around us, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a, like a 30, 40 mile stretch like I've got here. It can just be standing on a, uh, on, on, on a hill or the, the top of a, you know, maybe you already live in a, a block of flats and you're 10 floors up and you can just open the window and look like you've never looked before. Whatever it is that you can do, give it a try. And if you can't do any of those things, you know, reconnect with an old memory of your view. Find a beautiful photo, find something on YouTube, some calming video, not some travel video where somebody's, you know, yelling at you about, you know, all the amazing things that you can do and, you know, they give you five seconds to look at each one. I mean, some kind of, you know, mindful video where somebody has really captured something and they've stayed put, they've left the camera there to take it in for, I don't know, half an hour, an hour. The internet's full of, of really beautiful things that can help us to connect with nature and if we can't get outside to do them, you know, it is the next best thing. Use it. We're so lucky we have that. However you do it and however you take in the views and the sense of, of, of vastness, please do it and I want you to like just sit for a while and contemplate your smallness, your tininess. Yoro's just contemplating a gravy bone right now. You want another one, don't you? There you go. That's okay, just one. Gravy bones are the centre of Yoro's existence. Aren't they, love, eh? Mm. But you don't understand what I'm saying, unfortunately, so... There's nothing I can do about that. So I've got to the end of the field and I'm, I'm turning around and I'm walking back home. And something around perspective just came up for me with this because when I'm walking northwards, is it northwards? Let me figure that out. 
Mm, I think it's kind of northwest, to be honest. Yeah. When I'm walking, is it northwest? Northeast. Northeast. Don't rely on me as a map and a guide when you're lost in the forest, friends, because I will not be able to help you. It's northeast. When I walk northeast, my eyes are fixated on Edinburgh and on the sea, on the Faith of Forth, and that gorgeous view I explained to you. But, but when I walk back this way, it's on the Pentland Hills, and more of them become apparent and more of them become exposed, as, as does that horrible sounding um, vehicle in the distance there. How does that wind sound to you, friends? How do, how do you feel about the sound of wind? Just take it in for a moment. very biting wind I have to say but really refreshing because that sun is still beaming out and yet I think it's about three degrees Celsius today even though it's bright so there's definitely a, a bite in the wind but here my attention comes back as I'm walking back home which is the southwest those pointy hills of the Pentlands and the one in particular called Carnethy Hill which I've, I've definitely wrote about in my newsletters but I'm not sure how much I've spoken about it on the podcast but I'm sure I must have done because I'm obsessed with this hill so so forgive me I, I forget what I talk about after I've you know uploaded a, a podcast and a few months has gone by but that's my favorite hill because I see that one from the back of the garden again quite far in the distance and it makes me feel small every time I look at it there's something godlike about it and you can interpret God however you like I'm not even sure that I know what I mean when I say that to be honest with you but this This huge formation, it's towering above. And as I'm walking back, I'm going to tell you about the next thing that I view. And it's something quite mysterious, this. It's like a, it's almost like a, 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 a trick of the eye. It's like nature's magic in action. So. I'm walking and looking at another wee hill. This one, I don't think has a name, although I'm gonna to have to look into that because I'm writing about this hill, so I should, I should find out really. This is only a little hill, you know. I, I, I have no idea of sizes. My, my sense of measurement is as good as my sense of, uh, of, of geography, and, and it's as good as the mental compass that I have in my mind. So, not very good. And, But let's say it's your bog standard, fairly small hill, you know, you could walk up to the top in two or three minutes. But it's a, just this lovely wee green bump behind the village. And our village is just, it's a strip of cottages, basically. It's just a row of cottages with the, um, the forest on one end and fields at the other. This little bump has got some very interesting folklore about it. Um, so apparently there's buried treasure in this hill and it's the buried treasure of the Knights Templars. It's apparently in this hill. It's been legend in this village for a thousand years. Perhaps not quite a thousand years, let's say 900 years. So as I've explained before, this village temple is named after the Knights Templars. The ancient military order of, of monks who went on the crusades they were kind of like yeah 
a combination of spiritual monks and you know warriors, basically a, a very curious, uh, very curious sect. <laughs> and when they were when they were kind of you know forced out of the land in Scotland, that's a long story. I'm not going to go into. I'm more interested in the folklore than the history. That's just how I roll. They were reported to have buried the treasure, their treasure, they were very rich, here in Temple, just up the road from where their main church in Scotland was. And it was said that this hill in front of us is not actually a natural hill at all. It wasn't formed by nature as such. It was formed by the hands of human beings who piled this hill so high because they wanted to protect the treasure. They wanted the treasure to be so, so buried that no one would be able to get to it. And that's why there's this huge hill in front, in front of us. And what's the more amazing about this hill is that before I knew this story, uh, me and my partner would walk down this hill and it was, it, it was my partner who pointed it out to me first. He said, like, isn't it really strange how this hill, you, you, it, it, it's so dominant on the landscape when you walk towards it. And yet, when you look from our back garden, which is facing in exactly the same way, it's not there. So, you know, I'm walking southwest now and it, it, it's the most obvious thing. It's this, this smooth hill. You know, there are some trees on the top. At the moment, what, there's also what looks like a massive bird's nest in one of those trees. And yet, when we go to the back of our garden, which is just, you know, up the village a little bit, not very far at all, and you look at the back of our garden directly, in the direction of the hill, you don't see it. It's not there. This hill seems to have disappeared. And it's an incredible magic trick of nature, you know. And it turns out you can view it um, in the winter. It becomes revealed by the trees that are blocking it. But there's this illusion in the summer that it disappears. And... Uh, it feels apt to me that there's something magical and, and, and strange and mythical about this hill, given its folklore. Okay, folks, so I'm uh, going to talk a wee bit quieter now. So, apologies if you need to adjust your volume to hear me. Um, I just paused for a moment just to, to, to say hi to a neighbour. And um, I'm going to attempt, I've not tried this before, I'm going to attempt to to round up the podcast by actually walking up the village. So going up the, the, uh, the only street of, of our village and walk to the door, which might not be possible because one of the things about living in a, a, tiny, a tiny rural place is that um, on the one hand, there's a lot less people than there are in the city. But on the other hand, you know everybody. So when you see them, you kind of have to talk to them. That's just part of the deal of living in a village. But let's let's see what happens. I'm just going to talk you through it. And already the, the hill, the Knights Templar Hill where the treasure is buried has disappeared from view as I've become closer. I'm sure there are very good reasons related to topography as to why that's happened, but it could also be a wee bit magical, who knows. So Yoro's here with me. Yoro, for some reason we've developed this, um, this habit of, of him getting a gravy bone when we enter the village. It feels like there's something quite, there's, there's something <laughs> almost folkloric about that as well. Here you go, this is the See, this is the initiation spot where one must have a dog treat before one enters civilization. So, just going onto the street now and 
maybe I'll just talk you up the village, you know. Because one thing about working with big views and you know, taking in the kind of panoramic sight that I've just taken in is that it's interesting to play with your surroundings shortly afterwards, you know, so not to just shut your mind off as soon as you've done the, you know, the, the activity for want of a better word, you know, or you, you're, you've had your connection. But to actually notice like how differently you feel when you go into somewhere, you know, more closed. I'm trying to look at how I responded before to how I respond now. And it's huge differences in just the emotional feeling of being on a street, isn't it? Compared to um, being out in an expansive place. Hi, Mike. Come on, you're out. And I think one of those major differences is the feeling of of people around you know you're always on that sort of you're always you, aware of the potential to to socialize at any opportunity not that I necessarily relish it but I'm always expecting it you're always going to bark at some Labradors now I'm sure so I'll apologize in advance hi yeah hi yeah Oh my god. Hiya. Go. Oh, yeah. Come on, you. Hi. Come on, you. Okay. Dogs can be quite predictable, can't they? Okay, so take out my keys. Into the door. There we go, Yoro. Yes, my predictable friend, Yoro. And here we are. We're home. So, so yeah, that's what I really wanted to reflect on. And then, and then coming back in here, you know, after being out, first of all, with that huge expansive view, with all of the things that come came up in my mind, you know, everything from the 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 colour of the seawater to the legend of the Knights Templar, all of these triggers and associations we have in this huge vast space, yet that sense of, of complete openness and freedom, you know, coming back to, you know, our tiny house. Um such a strange mixture of feelings. And it, again, it's a, it's a really obvious thing to reflect on. And I think that's what ecotherapy is sometimes. It's reflecting on the, the, the painstakingly obvious because we don't do it enough. You know, looking at how we're responding to our surroundings. It's not just about, you know, quote unquote nature, but it's about land and space and how we're relating to it all and and not just coming home and all of a sudden feeling like oh I feel a bit more closed in now without consciously being aware of it but actually consciously looking at our responses understanding what is what how we're relating to the world you know as much as we can minute by minute you know some snippet here or there and then obviously we forget for hours you know because that's what we do I'm about to forget for hours, folks, because I'm going to get stuck into all of this work I was telling you that I needed to do. But just paying attention to our experience, paying attention to what Mother Nature has around us, but also to the, the buildings that we've created and that we live in and, 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 and experiencing ourselves as a part of it all. That's a big part of ecotherapy too. So I'm going to, you will have heard me kind of taking Yoro's doggy coat off because he's a whippet, so he gets very cold. I'm going to give him one last gravy bone. You can hear that he has got a problem with these and I definitely don't help by giving in and giving him all the treats he wants. 
Um, but I think that's a good place to end, folks. And what I would say is I would really like to hear from you if you do this sort of exercise or even if you've... Um, even if you've been listening to this and, and, and doing something, noticing of you whilst you were listening to the podcast or, um, or any thoughts you've had about it, I would love to hear from you. I, I, lo I love it when people contact me, you know, it makes me feel like I'm, I'm talking to people and I'm not just, you know, at the moment walking around my, my cottage talking to myself, you know, to, <laughs> which, which in reality is what I'm doing, you know, but... It, it's really nice to get that response from you. So if you have had any thoughts or experiences around big views and expanse and expanse and and all of that stuff we've been exploring, please let me know or or send me a picture or or whatever. You know, it'd just be lovely to hear from you. And and remember, I'm online at naturetherapyonline.net and I run all kinds of uh, ecotherapy projects groups all across the world by that lovely thing called the internet so um, if connecting with nature more deeply is something you would like to explore through mindfulness and, and myth then I'm your man so get in contact and uh, maybe you'll tune in again next month to my next podcast so you take care for now thank you so much for listening hugs from Scotland and bye bye Visit me online at naturetherapyonline.net.